So it is my pleasure to in introduce to you today's discovery lecture, Professor Andrea Tao of Nano Engineering Department. Professor Tao is a San Diego native. So when she was in Four Times High School, she came from Four Times. So she uh, uh, volunteered in a chemistry lab at UCSD. Then she obtained her bachelor's degree in chemistry and physics from Harvard. She is multidisciplinary. She studied self assembly of shaped metal nanoparticles and obtained her PhD in chemistry from UC Berkeley. Then she studied marine proteins in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology at UC San Barbara. In 2009, she joined the then newly established Nano Engineering Department. UC San Diego and started her independent work on nano composites and plasmonics. It's interesting for me to note that her extracurricular passion is rock climbing. So she already received numerous awards, including National Science Foundation, early career, and in new materials. The Young Investigator Awards from the European Materials Research Society and Young Faculty Award from the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA. So let us work on the top. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, so can everybody hear me? I think we're waiting for a new microphone. So I'll try to be pretty loud until that microphone gets here. But um, hi, my name is Andrea Tao, and, and thank you, Charles, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be giving this lecture here today because, as Professor Tu mentioned, um, I started my science career here at UCSD as a high school student. In fact, it was my sophomore year in high school. I was taking AP Chemistry, and my teacher bribed us with, I think, 100 points of extra credit if we did a science fair project. And so my friend and I basically went to the library, went on online. So at that, at that time, not everybody had internet connections in their house. So we went online and we looked up all of the faculty members and their phone numbers on UC, at UCSC in the chemistry department. And we cold called people and asked if we could work in their labs. And I happened to get uh, Michael Saylor, who is a professor in the chemistry department here. He answered his phone and invited me to come work in his lab for a semester. And I extended it to about two years' worth of research. And that's how I got my start. And now I'm back on campus as an associate faculty member in the nanoengineering department. Um, and I'm here to give you this lecture. So was that the new mic or? OK. I think that's one more part. OK. All right. So, I guess I'll begin. Um, I was thinking about what would be interesting for uh, a group of high school students to learn about. Um, and I think most people have probably heard of nanotechnology. How many people have heard of nanotechnology or nanoengineering or nanoscience? OK, awesome. So um, today I thought I would give you kind of a taste of what I typically teach the college students who are uh, about junior level uh, in my class, which is Fundamental Principles of Nano Engineering, and Principles. And so the lecture that you're going to hear today is a little bit of a mix of the first lecture I gave in that class, as well as the last lecture in that class. So it's basically the most interesting things combined in one of them. And then I'll talk a little bit about the research that I do here on campus on understanding nanomaterials for uh, OK, so what is? the definition of nanotechnology. Who here has a good definition? You can just shout it. It's really small. How small is small? So what does it mean? What does it mean to be at the nanoscale? 10 to the negative 9 meters, so you guys know the, the length scale. What happens when you start to get the, that length scale? Why, why are nanomaterials or why is nanotechnology so special? When you're at those length scales, length scales, you start to get to the length scales of atoms. 
And at those line scales, you end up seeing properties that you wouldn't normally see in bulk materials. A lot of times people mention things like quantum effects. You start to see the effects of when you're shrinking your material down to the length scale of an electron or the path of an electron. So nanotechnology can actually have a wide number of definitions. We can talk about the length scale. We can talk about a material that's nanosized. We can talk about a process that involves a nanomaterial or involves a phenomenon at the nanoscale. So nanotechnology is really just a generic term for anything that involves something at that 10 to the negative 9 meter scale. It can be a material, a process, or a phenomenon. So at the start of my, my class, at the start of Nano 102, I always like to define the nanoscale, and you guys know exactly what that is. So at the Nano, we're at 10 to the negative 9. And that means that uh, we're right around this length scale here. And I always point this out to my students, this conversion factor, that when you, you're talking about something that's one nanometer, which is our scale for nanomaterials or nanotechnologies, this is equivalent to 10 angstroms, which is our scale for atoms and molecules. So I want to point out that we're not too far away when we're dealing with nanomaterials. We're not too far away for uh, the building blocks of nature. So we're pretty close to the scale for atoms and molecules. So the things that make up all of the solids and all of uh, matter. OK, so normally when people talk about nanotechnology, you can break it up into two different kinds of components. So uh, in the first component, when we talk about nanotechnology, we can be talking about a nanomaterial. So in this case, we can think of a material where our size of the material is uh, below 10 nanometers. And so this is where we would see quantum effects. Um, you can think of also larger materials, so something larger than 10 nanometers, that has properties between classical and quantum. <laughs> Um, and this means that those materials interact on the nanoscale. So the material doesn't necessarily have to be below 10 nanometers, but its interactions with another material occur at this length scale. And in some cases, people think of large molecules as being at the nanoscale. So large molecules that are around a few nanometers in size can be considered a nanomaterial. So the second component of nanotechnology is what people actually consider the, the technology. So what is able uh, by the nanoscale. So these can be technologies that are enabled by specific nanomaterials, or again, they can be enabled by a process that occurs at the nanoscale. So these are just some general definitions to give you an idea of what we think of as nanotechnology. Um, so one of the things that actually sparked the nanotechnology revolution was this guy here, Richard Feynman. So how many of you have heard of Richard Feynman? OK, a few of you. Sometimes he's considered the grandfather of nanotechnology. Um, he was a professor of physics at Caltech, so in Pasadena, Southern California. Um, and he gave this talk in 1959, so a long time ago, right? Way before anybody had ever heard of nanotechnology. Richard Feynman gave this talk at the American Physical Society called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And the way he began this talk is, what I want to talk about is the problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. So already in 1959, Dr. Feynman had this vision that things were going to start shrinking. And so he posed two problems to his audience that day. Uh, the first problem was that in the future, he believed that we would be able to take a lot of information and shrink it down to a very small volume. So he asked his audience, uh, would it be possible to write the entire 24 volumes of an encyclopedia, an Encyclopedia Britannica, on the head of a pin? So that's one thing that he was thinking about, how to take information and shrink it down to the nanoscale. And the second challenge that he posed to his audience was, could we make an electric motor that's really small? So could we make a rotating electric motor which can be controlled from the outside and that's only 1 64th inch cubed? So, this was done, I think, in the late 70s when people started to fabricate uh, things using photolithography. But um, I think this is an interesting problem because you could actually do this calculation. So I won't actually do the calculation, but what, what's one way you would think of trying to solve this problem on paper? So what do you have to do when you're actually printing an encyclopedia? And I realize this is maybe a little bit outdated since you guys probably use Wikipedia, not an encyclopedia. But what's the smallest feature that you would have to print in an encyclopedia? 
Someone said a period. Someone said a comma. So essentially, that's right, like a punctuation mark, right? So you can consider the dot of an I. And if you consider the font size, maybe you say like 10 or 12 point font, you could calculate what size it would have to be and shrink it down to what the size of a pinhead is. So essentially, we're taking the smallest feature and shrinking it down to 1 16th of an inch. So again, I won't take you through that calculation, but if you were to do that, which just involves some stoichiometry, essentially what you end up with is that the smallest feature in your encyclopedia, the dot of an eye, should be about equivalent to around 10 iron atoms. So assuming that this pinhead right here, so the top of the pin is made out of iron or some metal, you can calculate that that dot should be a few atoms. So what does that actually mean in terms of being able to shrink all of that information down to the size of a pinhead? Is that possible to get something around 10 atoms wide? So some, I heard someone say no, but 10 atoms is actually pretty reasonable. We can actually think about manipulating 10 atoms. Uh, so that means that the problem that Richard Feynman imposed on his audience, can we shrink all that information down to the size of a metal pinhead, could absolutely be done with 10 iron atoms. Uh, but what does this also mean for what we're going to use as our building block for, for storing that information? We're no longer going to be printing with inks or writing things on paper, but now we're storing things in matter itself. So what this problem shows most of the students in my class is that nanotechnology is not impossible. It's something that can be done with atoms, with matter, that we can actually manipulate. And that the building blocks for nanotechnology and nanomaterials are going to be atoms and molecules. So we're going to use those as uh, the building blocks of our nanoscale materials. So that's kind of like a Gedanken example. That's a thought experiment that I would give to my students. But when I actually started working in a lab here on campus, when I was a high school student, I didn't really care about thought experiments. What I wanted to do was understand the world around me. So I thought I would give you some other more real world examples of nanotechnology just to show that it's not all about trying to get information down to a small scale. It's not about necessarily making small little objects. But it's really about understanding uh, the properties at the nanoscale. OK. So the first uh, topic that I want to bring up is this guy right here. So how many people know what this is? It's a gecko. Um, and the gecko is actually a great example of nanotechnology in nature. So what's cool about geckos is that they can basically crawl on any surface. So if you've ever been to the zoo and you go into a reptile section and they have geckos, you usually see that geckos are all over the glass of their cages. They're hanging upside down and sometimes they're, they're on the, the side walls. So geckos are known for their ability to climb up walls, to hang upside down, to do kind of crazy maneuvers, which as a rock climber is really cool. Um, and so in, in technology, we're always trying to mimic geckos. When we think of really great climbers, we're always thinking of these geckos that can basically scale up any surface. So what's interesting is that if you have an animal like the gecko, if you have this organism that can climb up walls, somehow it's sticking to all of these materials, but it's still able to move. The gecko is still able to peel its feet off of those walls and move them up inch by inch. So one of the questions that researchers ask themselves is, how do geckos temporarily adhere to these different surfaces with these strong interactions, but still allow them to peel off their feet and continuously climb up a surface? Um, and so just to give you an example of what we consider as uh, biomimetic, so mimicking nature, this is uh, a climber using these um, electrical gecko feet, so I think these are all power, uh, power run. And here's another little robot that I think this was from Stanford University where they put these little gecko pads uh, and tried to get this thing to climb up a wall. And I don't know how many of you guys have seen Mission Impossible. You might be a little too young for that. But uh, in one of the Mission Impossibles, Tom Cruise is in Dubai, and he's climbing up a wall, and he's using these little uh, uh, electrical gecko feet. Um, so not the best example of biomimicry, but one. OK. So 
People ask themselves, OK, we want to figure out how the gecko climbs up these walls. Well, why don't we take a closer look at gecko feet? OK, so what people did was they first took a look at the gecko foot. So what you're looking at here are images of the gecko foot. And we're consistently zooming in on the bottom of one of the toes. So what you can see here is that the gecko foot isn't covered with a smooth piece of skin. It's actually covered with uh, these rows of stem depth. So these small colors, the scale marker is about 75 microns, and microns are negative 60 meters. So we're still not in the nanoscale yet. So the gecko foot's covered with all these colors. And on top of these colors, there are these little square pads. So we're going to zoom in on those pads. So using an electron microscope, uh, they took one of these CETA and zoomed in on that little pad. And you can see at the top of the pad, there's even more structure. So at the top of the pad, that square is made up of these micron-like spatula. So the pad of this is made up of even more colors. And those colors, you can see, are at the scale. So these are about, the scale right here is about So that means that each of these colors is about 200 nanometers in size. So that means that this gecko is using the CETA and the spatula to somehow allow itself to climb up these walls. So this is a very interesting structure that people didn't expect for gecko feet. You have pillars that are on top of other pillars, and that's what's being present in the surface of these gecko feet. So one of the really big questions in, in biology when we found this out was, OK, well, you know, the gecko is able to climb the walls, but so are other animals. So a lot of animals like the tree frog here are also able to stick to surfaces. Um, and the way the tree frog does it is that it actually secretes a mucus. So if you do the same thing, you take a tree frog and you zoom in, you use an electron microscope or a really powerful camera to look at one of the toes of a tree frog, you'll zoom in and see that that surface of the tree frog's toe is also not smooth. It's pretty rough. And if you take a cross section, you'll see that this roughness is coming from these small pores of the tree frog's uh, skin. And then this is where we can see the tree frog. So the mucus is actually what allows the tree frog to adhere to different surfaces. It's essentially an adhesive. It's acting like a post it note. It's letting the tree frog move around uh, and stick to things. So people want to know, okay, well, the tree frog uses capillary adhesion, uses adhesion from this, this secreted mucus to climb up things. Is that what is going on with the gecko feet? Is that the role of these uh, spatula? Okay, so that's our question. How does the gecko climb up these walls? What are the roles of the spatula on the end of the gecko toes? <laughs> and does the gecko actually have mucus secretions that allow adhesion? Is that the role of the spatula? So in the case of the tree frog, when we talk about this capillary adhesion mechanism, mechanism or this mucus, what we're actually talking about is a liquid that's essentially between two, two solid surfaces. And the force that's actually holding these two together is generated by the likelihood that this liquid will like the insect pads, so it'll like to stick to the surface of the tree frog toe, or it'll like to stick to the surface <laughs> of, the, of whatever it's climbing on. So the force that's holding the tree frog to a tree or to a glass cage is essentially related to the properties of this liquid. And usually we can measure that in experiments by looking at the shape of the liquid droplet. So we're looking at the shape of the liquid edge or meniscus of whatever that mucus secretion is on different surfaces. So it turns out that geckos actually don't secrete mucus, so people know this, but that liquid could be water vapor, right? So geckos typically exist in humid environments all around us are water molecules, so it could be that water is condensing on the surface of the gecko toe. So we're still not sure, even though it doesn't secrete mucus, we're still not actually sure what's going on. So there's another mechanism that we can talk about, which is a van der Waals mechanism. So it turns out that when you start to shrink materials down to the nanoscale, there are essentially forces that are related to the number of electrons in your, in your material that can become very strong at the nanoscale. Uh, we call these van der Waals forces. And they're essentially a function of a few different materials properties that are, again, related to how electron dense your material is. 
Um, so you can see this equation here. I won't go through it. But it's basically saying that the energy of interaction between this sphere right here, so maybe that's our gecko uh, spatula, and a surface, so like the tree or the glass cage, that this is a function of how, much, how electron dense your material is. So in other words, it's a function of the dipole moment of your material pol and polarizability. So that means that the force holding your gecko to its glass walls is dependent specifically on what we call a dielectric constant, as well as the size of the spatula. So that's this r, the radius of this ball right here. So in other words, we have two mechanisms we're considering. One is capillary adhesion, in which case we're specifically looking at the shape of this liquid meniscus, so the contact angle. Um, and the second one is van der Waals forces, where we're looking at uh, the properties of the material and the gecko pad size. OK, so people actually did these experiments. Uh, they basically took geckos from the lab, and they said, OK, we're going to stick the gecko toes onto two different materials. So the first material is gallium arsenide. It's a semiconductor that you can buy. Um, and it's highly hydrophobic, mean, meaning it likes to repel water. So if you look at the contact angle, if you stick a water droplet on that gallium arsenide surface, it'll stay pretty close to spherical because it doesn't like to wet the surface of gallium arsenide. Um, and this material is also very highly polarizable, so its dielectric constant is quite high. So the second material that we can compare to gallium arsenide is silicon dioxide. So this is just glass. We can take a piece of glass. Uh, glass is an insulator, and it's also a hydrophilic surface, meaning that it likes to stick to water. So water will lay pretty flat, meaning its contact angle is close to zero. And this is also fairly highly polarizable. So what does this mean in terms of our mechanisms? So if we're looking at, at, at the secretion or water droplets condensing between the gecko pad and the surface, that means that if we have something like silicon dioxide, where water likes to wet the surface, um, that the gecko should stick to glass, but not stick to gallium arsenide, because gallium arsenide is hydrophobic. Whereas if we're talking about the second mechanism, where it's all about how electron dense our material is, and it's all about the van der Waals interaction, um, then these two interactions should essentially be the same, because both of these materials are essentially pretty highly polarizable. So the force between the gecko and gallium arsenide, or the gecko and silicon dioxide, should be about the same. So in other words, this is our capillary adhesion prediction. So our hydrophilic surface should have a high force. Our hydrophobic surface should have a low force. And our van der Waals adhesion prediction means that our hydrophobic and our hydrophilic surfaces should have exactly the same forces. So this is the experiment. So here's this gecko. Here's a wafer of gallium arsenide. So these are basically what computer chips are fabricated on. And they stuck the gecko pad to the gallium arsenide wafer and measured the force required to actually peel the gecko foot off of this. I don't think any geckos were harmed in this experiment. OK, so th this is the data that they actually got. So they measured the shear stress, so the stress required to actually pull that gecko foot off of these two different wafers. And they see that for silic silica and gallium arsenide, so our hydrophilic and our hydrophobic surface, the shear stress is the same, and the adhesion force is also the same. This data was done using a little cantilever to specifically measure the force of a few spatula. So what does this mean for our gecko pad? Which force is it? Van der Waals forces, which means that it doesn't actually matter what's in between the gecko pad and the surface, but it does matter how big the pad of that gecko toe is. So that spatula, which was about 200 nanometers, is what makes this force so strong. It's what makes this Van der Waals force work so well. So it's because that spatula is nanoscale that we get this strong force um, from Van der Waals adhesion. So adhesive force depends more on the size of those gecko pads rather than on the nature of the material. OK, so that's my first example of nanotechnology in nature. Um, and the second one that I wanted to bring up was the human genome. So how many people know what this is? What is it? <laughs> A chromosome. So have you guys ever actually thought about what the chromosome is made up of? DNA. Have you thought of how much DNA is actually in your chromosome? 
a lot. So, so DNA packaging is another problem where we start to talk about what happens at the nanoscale. Um, and this is actually a, a really fascinating problem to me. So if you think about it, almost every human cell contains about 6 billion base pairs of DNA. And the size of a base pair, um, so if you're thinking about AT or GC connections, the size of this base pair is about 0.34 nanometers. So if you calculate how much DNA is in one cell, you'll get that this is around two meters of DNA. That is a lot of material. And if you think about how many cells you have in your body, so you can make an estimate of how big a cell is and probably assume that you guys are a sphere and do some volume approximation here. Um, if we have 50 trillion cells in one human body, that means that we have about 100 trillion meters of DNA in a single human. That is a lot of material. So that means that each of us has enough DNA to go around the Earth's equator around 2.5 million times. How do we get all of that DNA into our bodies? How do we store all that information? It's another version of Feynman's problem, right? Storing all of that information from the encyclopedia onto a pinhead. This is how nature does it. Nature stores information in the form of chromosomes. And chromosomes are essentially tightly wound strands of DNA. But have you guys ever tried to take string or a piece of rope and try to jam it into a backpack? I do this all the time as a climber. You try to take big, uh, long uh, climbing ropes and try to jam it into your hiking backpack. How many of you have actually tried this? It's really difficult to do, right? To, to try to stuff all of that material into a really small volume. So how does nature actually do it? It's not disorganized, it's actually extremely organized. So if we start off at the nanoscale, so we start off at our simple, uh, our DNA double helix, this is what it looks like. What nature actually does is it starts winding DNA. So the first winding uh, piece that we get is the double helix. So it's twisting the DNA. And then you take that DNA strand and you start winding it around a nucleosome. A nucleosome <laughs> is essentially a protein. And that protein has a very specific shape. It's a disc shape. So now imagine winding a string around a spool. So you're taking like thread and winding around a spool. So that's the first level of hierarchy that we see in DNA. The second one is now you have multiple spools. So let's say you have about eight of these spools. And you start winding DNA around those spools. And then you start winding those spools around each other. So here we have those nucleosomes. Turns out that once you start winding DNA around these guys, and they get so tightly wound that these guys all assemble into another coiled structure. So now you're creating a coil out of your coil. Well, that's kind of weird. So you're taking these nucleosomes and you're arranging them into the coil. And then you're taking this coil, which we've made out of our nucleosomes, and you're winding that back and forth on itself. So you're creating this other coil right here. Okay, so you think that that would be it, right? So now how many coils do we have? We have one, two, three, four levels of hierarchy. And then we can go one further. To actually make the chromosome, we now take the coil of the coil of the coil and make another one. So this is how we get DNA packaged into a chromosome. We essentially have these five to six levels of hierarchy where all, we're, all nature is doing is spooling these things around. So chromosomes are composed of really compact DNA, tightly wound around nucleosomes, but it's a lot more complicated than just winding DNA. You have these different levels of hierarchy, and somehow you have to have these nucleosomes all interacting perfectly with the right intermolecular forces to form these tightly wound structures. Okay. So this is actually a problem that researchers on UCSD's campus study. So what they look at are the nucleosomes or uh, um, groups of nucleosomes called histones and its interaction with DNA and how that forms chromatin or how that forms the basic structures of our chromosomes. So what people have found is that histones provide energy mainly in the form of electrostatic interactions, so charges. So taking positive and ne negative charges on the DNA as well as on the protein to be able to fold DNA. And it turns out this is actually a really interesting problem if you think about uh, the, the structure. So the interactions between these histones, these proteins, and DNA, as well as the tails, so the proteins coming off of these histones, 
those interactions are still unknown. People don't know why this happens, why these nucleosomes, which are composed of histones, coil up here. They're not quite sure yet. So people have looked at, at modeling or simulations to try to figure that out. Um, the overall detailed structure of chromatin is still really controversial. Oops. So it turns out that while we know that this double helix structure exists and we know that DNA is winding around these nucleosomes, this process and this structure is actually not well characterized. So it's still a big question. So even though you might see the structure of a chromosome in a textbook, the fine detail, how this structure is made, is not really well understood. And similarly, people don't know why chromosomes are packaged that way or why histones are modified in this way to form these coiled structures. We don't know if it has to do with gene regulation, and we don't know if diseases uh, that are related to our genes actually get expressed because of defects in the structure. So there's a lot of unknowns result, uh, regarding the structure of DNA and how that relates to human health. So I think it's a really interesting problem. Again, it's not really something that you can go into a lab and carry out an experiment that will provide the answers, not the way that, that the gecko foot experiment did. Uh, so I just wanted to bring up, if you're interested in this problem, one of my colleagues, Gorb Arya, works on modeling these kinds of interactions. He's also in the nanoengineering department, and he specifically looks at the interactions between histones and DNA um, using coarse grain modeling, meaning that each of these things in his computer simulation is a blob, and he studies how these blobs interact with each other. Okay. Okay, so the last example that I wanted to bring up is related to my own research, and that's looking at light matter interactions at the nanoscale. So when I first started uh, looking at nanomaterials, I was really interested in uh, images like these. So this is a morpho butterfly, and it's kind of the standard, it's like the stock image that people use for looking at optics at the nanoscale. And it's because this butterfly, this blue color, is not coming from a pigment. It's actually coming from really small crystal lights that the butterfly generates on its wings that scatter light. So it's coming from uh, scattered light that scatters only blue. And that's why when you look at this morpho butterfly, it looks iridescent, and if you change the angle that you're viewing it from, this blue color will go away. It's called structural color, so it's not a pigment. It comes from the nanoscale structures that the butterfly wing is made up of. So I was really interested in understanding these kinds of light matter interactions at the nanoscale. Um, so I wanted to pose a problem to you guys. So what is the scale of light? It's kind of a weird question, right, when you think of what's the scale of light. So let's think about it in terms of a material. So one of the materials that I work with in the lab is silver. And if you guys ever have looked in a mirror, then you've looked at the optical properties of a silver film. So silver films reflect almost all visible light, right? So if you make a silver film, it's really shiny. You'll see your reflection in it. So that means that across all of the visible wavelengths, it'll reflect light back to you. And the wavelength of green light, right in the middle of the visible spectrum, is about 500 nanometers. So what happens when we take our silver film and move it down to the nanoscale? So we start chopping up our silver film, and we get all the way down to a particle or a piece of our film that's less than 200 nanometers. What do you guys think will happen? Any guesses? So we know in the bulk that silver is going to reflect 500 nanometer light, but what happens when the piece of silver that we're dealing with is sub-wavelength, smaller than the wavelength of light itself? Does it reflect? Does it absorb? Does it transmit that light? Scatters. Scatters. How did you know that? <laughs> so it's actually a little bit more complicated. It actually does all of those things. So a silver particle will scatter or reflect light. It will also absorb and will also transmit. So it does a combination of all of those things when it's 200 nanometers. So it doesn't just reflect light. It actually uh, absorbs, reflects, and transmits light. And this was something that was known back in the fourth century AD. So this is an example of, this is probably the oldest example of nanotechnology that I know of. 
Um, this is a, a porcelain cup called the Lycurgus cup that's in the British Museum. And uh, it has the uh, god Bacchus on the surface. So this is, I think it's the god of wine. Um, and if you shine light on this cup, you see that it reflects this green color. So there's our 500 nanometer light. It's being reflected back at us. But if you were to take a light bulb and actually put it inside the cup, you see that you only get red light coming out. So that means that you're actually getting green light scattered, but you're getting red light transmitted. And the reason why is that this porcelain is essentially uh, coated with silver nanoparticles, about 200 nanometers in size. So people a long time ago knew that these particles actually can scatter, reflect, and absorb light very differently than the bulk materials. And they used it for decorating things like these porcelain cups or stained glass windows. When you look at stained glass windows and you see the color purple, you're actually looking at gold nanoparticles that are scattering light um, at different wavelengths. So this is the oldest example of uh, optical nanotechnology that, that I know of. And so we wanted to take this one step further in our laboratory. So size is one way you can, you can control how a nanoparticle interacts with light. And in our lab, we take this one step further by not only controlling size, but we control the shape of a nanoparticle. So in, in my group, we take metals like silver and gold, and we synthesize them uh, into different shapes. So this is an example of silver spheres. Here we have gold nanorods, and I should point out the scale bars. These, these scale bars are 200 nanometers. So that means that these spheres here are about 30 nanometers, and these gold rods are about 40 nanometers in length. Uh, this is an example of these triangular prisms that are composed of silver. They're about 200 nanometers in edge length. And my favorite shape are these cubes. So you're looking at a, a 2D projection of these cubes, and they're about 100 nanometers in size. And the way we control the growth of these materials, the way we control shape, is we actually grow these in liquids. So we take something like a metal salt, and we reduce it to form our metal, and we throw in organics. We throw in things like polymers and surfactants that have a preferential binding to specific crystal faces of our metal. And so in this case, when we're making something like these silver cubes, we have this polymer that has very specific interactions to uh, crystal faces so that each one of these cube sides and edges is atomically identical. So in this manner, my group tries to use chemical synthesis to provide morphology control over metal and semiconductor uh, nanoparticles. So this is just another example of these nanocubes. So here's our version of that Lycurgus cup that I showed you earlier. This is actually a solution of silver nanocubes that one of my students has made. This vial holds about 20 milliliters. So in nanomaterial standards, that's a lot. And when you're actually looking at the solution here, this is filled with these 100 nanometer silver cubes. So you can see that when light is shining directly on it, you get this green color that's reflected back at you. But if you kind of shake around the vial and get a really thin coating on the glass here and hold it up to the light, you can see that red is actually transmitted through. So uh, if you take the same solution and you dry it out and you look at it under an electron microscope, you can see that this is, this is what you'll get. This is what the material is composed of. So about 95% of these are these cubes. Um, and then you also see some defects here, like these tetrahedra or triangular prisms. Okay. And so this image is showing what shape can actually do. So remember, if you were to take a bulk silver film, what would you actually expect uh, this spectrum to look like? This is a reflectance spectrum or a scattering spectrum. So on the y-axis is intensity, and on the x-axis is wavelength. So this spans from 400 to 1,000 nanometers, so it's spanning the whole visible regime. So remember, green light is somewhere around here. So if you had a silver film, what should the spectrum actually look like? If you're saying that all visible light of all, all wavelengths is being reflected back to you. Yeah, it would be flat. You would basically see that if this were a percentage going from 0% no light to 100% all light being reflected back, bulk silver would just be a flat line. It would reflect everything back. But these spectra are actually for our shaped silver particles. And you can see that there are these really intense peaks, right? So if we look at something like these silver cubes, uh, this is the scattering spectrum here in the green. You can see one, two, three, 
four peaks. There's actually a fifth one here, but it's a little bit buried. You can actually see four peaks that occur. And why does it have these four peaks? Why isn't it just a flat line? Well, it turns out that when you shine light onto these metallic particles, that light excites oscillations in the free electrons of your metal. So you remember that metals are composed of your, your free sea of electrons that are floating around your nuclear cores. Uh, what that light does is it starts interacting with your metal, causing those electrons to oscillate. And depending on the size and shape of your particle, you only get those oscillations at very specific resonant frequencies. So essentially, these cubes or these particles are acting as little oscillators every time you shine the right uh, wavelength of light on them. So for cubes, you actually get these five peaks because you get five resonances, whereas for something like a sphere, you would only get one peak, one resonance. So uh, that would be, let's see, the sphere in blue here. So you see this one peak right here. So why is that? Why for a sphere would you only get one resonance, whereas from something that's anisotropic, you would get multiple resonances? Well, if you think about your particle as a little packet of electrons, so here's our packet of electrons, what direction are those electrons going to oscillate for a sphere? Does it matter which direction? It all looks the same to the sphere because it's totally symmetric. So essentially, you're just going to get one oscillation up and down. And it doesn't matter how that oscillation is oriented because that sphere looks the same from all directions. So that means in the optical spectrum, we only see one peak for one resonance. Whereas for a cube, you're breaking that symmetry. So now if you think of your little packet of electrons as being cube-shaped, how many different oscillations can you get? Well, they can go up and down. Your electrons can go into the corners, maybe diagonally. It can go along the edges. So there are a lot of different variations on this. Uh, and depending on the symmetry, you're going to break uh, the symmetry of the sphere and get these multiple resonances. So it's one way of controlling light matter interactions. Not only can we shrink the size of our particle down to the nanoscale so that it's not reflecting all wavelengths, we can choose one specific wavelength, um, and then we can also tune where that wavelength is or how many of those wavelengths we have by changing the shape of these particles. So what does that mean for nanotechnology or nanomaterials? Well, what we recognize is that this oscillation that you get from these shapes is actually coming from light being localized on the surface of the particle. So that light is interacting with the electrons of your metal. And essentially what that means is uh, light is focusing. So each of these little particles is acting as a little optical antenna. It's focusing light at its surface. But if you think about it, it's really weird because this particle is smaller than the wavelength of light itself. So we're getting a sub-wavelength antenna. Um, and we're interested in looking at how shape and size changes these optical properties. So here's a, a sample where we've made gold nanorods. And you can see that the color is very different. You get this, uh, the combination of red and blue being reflected back. And again, that's due to the asymmetry of the particle. Um, we're also interested in how putting particles together, how assembling particles into nanojunctions so, uh, can change this light matter interaction. So in this case, we have two cubes or a string of cubes that are all assembled uh, along their edges. And instead of interacting with just electrons from a single cube, now when you shine light on this structure, you actually get electrons uh, oscillations that are coupled along the length of the string. So we work a lot on how do we assemble uh, cubes into interesting and functional structures. Um, you can also make large scale materials. So we can take these cubes and we put them into polymers. So for example, this is an example of a metamaterial. Um, we call it a metamaterial because it's made up of a number of different nanocomponents. So in this case, this is a, a polymer film that's embedded with our silver nanocubes. And you can see that bright green color is being reflected back to you because we've arranged those nanocubes. If you were to zoom in on this with an electron microscope, we've arranged them in a periodic array. Um, and then we can also take these cubes and put them on the end of an atomic force microscope tip. So this is something that you would use to maybe scan a material. Um, so if you imagine an AFM tip coming along a material, you typically get topology measurements because you have this tip going up and down as it scans over a surface. Now we can take these little optical antenna, uh, assemble them onto the end of one of these tips, and now we can carry out experiments where we're shining light onto our tip and getting uh, light matter interactions between uh, the tip and a surface at this 100 nanometer junction.
And so we're interested in, in using all of these materials for applications that involve biosensing and chemical sensing, as well as just fundamental applications where we're interested in what kinds of chemistries can we uh, make to achieve these different kinds of shapes and structures. So I just wanted to end with uh, acknowledgments of my group. So these are people who work in my group, grad students, um, undergraduates, and postdocs uh, who work on the materials that I showed you for the cubes. I don't have a slide for the, the uh, uh, gecko feet or the chromatin uh, slides. But if you're interested in those subjects, you can come ask me questions after this talk. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much for a very fascinating talk. So now we have time for questions. <laughs> Practical applications of nanotechnology. Um, so I can give you one very practical application for some of these uh, silver materials, and then I can list a, a bunch more. So how many of you guys have transition lenses? The lenses that when you walk outside, they'll turn dark to protect your eyes from UV light. What those actually are, your glass lenses are embedded with silver particles. And when you shine light onto those, your lenses, it's actually making your particle grow larger to the point where now it reflects, or depending on the size of the particles, it'll actually reflect more light. And so you're seeing that dark color because you're growing nanoparticles larger. Um, and the glass will react with those particles when you're not shining light on it to shrink it down so that your lenses become transparent. So that, that's kind of one of uh, a low level application, I guess, of nanotechnology. Um, one thing that people are also doing with these uh, nanoparticles is that when you shine light on it and the particles are engineered to absorb a lot of light, when you absorb light, it essentially means that, that those photons, that energy from light is being converted to heat. So uh, one thing that people are doing is that they're taking these metal particles, silver and gold particles, and they're uh, modifying the surface so that these particles will actually attach to cancer cells. So they'll invade cancer tumors. And now you can think about uh, not necessarily surgically removing a tumor, but shining light on it. And those particles will actually get really hot, and they'll kill or they'll ablate those tumor cells. So uh, we call that photothermal therapy. So those are two applications for uh, the particles. But really, if you were to go onto the Nano Engineering Department's website, you'll see that um, there's a range of topics that are studied by the faculty. Um, and that would give you a good idea of what are some applications? So we have people who work on batteries, on solar cells, on um, nanomedicine, so ways to fight cancer using nanomaterials, ways to sense for uh, human diseases before you know, your doctor can tell, personalized medicine. So there's a number of different practical applications that people are pursuing. But those are the two that I can think of for the particles. So um, that's an interesting question. So people have known about these materials properties for a long time, but they weren't actually able to visualize them because they didn't have things like electron microscopes or even optical microscopes. So people would actually uh, mine for metals. I think they knew the, the value of these metals, but it was kind of just like, um, we call it shake and bake chemistry, where you take a bunch of things and you throw it in the fire and sinter them together. So it was somehow a trial and error process for these artisans who are working with these materials. And that's actually the way a lot of um, uh, metal and inorganic chemistry started off was uh, based off of what alchemists and ceramicists, you know, people who were doing this for craft back in the day, uh, from a lot of their discoveries. This one over there. <laughs> Oh, that's a really good question. So how does nature extract that information from our chromosome? Have you guys ever thought about that? So DNA can store all of our information, but how does it get it out of there? <laughs> 
There's a lot of mach machinery involved in extracting that information from a cell, right? Because DNA essentially encodes proteins, and those proteins go out of our cell machinery and interact with other cells, or you have uh, interesting um, like receptor and target interaction. So it's actually quite complicated in terms of how nature can extract information. But if you think about a computer, how do you extract information that's stored on your hard drive? You have something that reads it. So in your hard drive, you have a needle or head. You probably know more about this than I do. And you extract that information through physical mechanisms. So there's, there's machinery involved in both cases where you're designing it to extract the information that you've stored. That's a whole nother problem. Very good question. My science fair project um, was on oxidation of silicon nanocrystallites. So, <laughs> you know what, it sounds, it sounds really fancy, but when I go back and think about those experiments, they were pretty dopey. So basically I made these silicon nanocrystal materials and I oxidized them by sticking them in an oven and allowing it to bake for certain periods of time and at certain temperatures. And I studied how those how those different bake times affected the optical properties of the silicon nanocrystals. I didn't quite understand what I was doing when I was doing those experiments, but after a few years of studying chemistry and physics and material science, it all started to make sense. So if there's anything, any piece of advice that I can offer you guys it, to take away from, from your research experiences or experiences in this program, is that you don't have to understand every single detail of the projects you're working on. Eventually, you probably will as you begin to gain that expertise. But as long as you're excited by what you're doing and you're excited by what you're learning, that's, that's the main thing to, to, to keep with you. Stay excited. Thank you very much.